hey guys, thank you so much for joining us tonight at Relentless Church. We're so excited to have you with us um, as we worship and as we gather together um, to go through God's word tonight. Uh, If you're new or visiting, my name is Mason, and I'm uh, the director of global outreach and prayer here at the church. Um, And I get to bring the message tonight as we continue in our series, Grace and Truth, 100 Days with Jesus. And the goal of this series and the reason why we're going through this 100-day journey of just looking at Jesus is that we just, as a church and as a body, want to pause and just look at Jesus. And like, if you were to picture Jesus as a gem or as a jewel, we just want to every single week just turn the jewel and just look at every facet of the beauty of Christ. And tonight in this passage from the words of Jesus, we learn about what he would require of those who wish to follow him. And we learn from his actions about who he is and what his heart beats for. And so um, tonight, the, t- the passage that we're talking about is very important to Jesus. And that might sound weird, like saying that a passage of the Bible is important, but we know that this story is very important because God includes it not only in this gospel, but also in the gospel of Mark and Luke. Not only this, but Jesus is going to say essentially the same thing he says in chapter 18, just one chapter later in chapter 19. And so you know what's important to your parent or to the people in your life based off of what they repeat to you. When somebody says something over and over again, or when a parent tells a child something and repeats it over and over again, you know that it's important and that they're trying to drill it into your head for a reason. And so if, um, if you've ever felt low or um, maybe struggled because you felt like you didn't understand something that God was trying to tell you, or you feel like Jesus is just trying to teach you the same lesson over and over again, we can take courage uh, looking at this passage tonight and really at the entirety of the Gospels because we see time and time again that no matter how many times Jesus said something, disciples always seem to forget it and they just needed to be reminded. And so we're reminded tonight too just of the grace of Jesus and his patience with us. And so um, again, we see, uh, we just read from chapter 18 what Jesus says about coming into the kingdom, that if you want to be in the kingdom, that you must humble yourself like a child. And then he repeats this very same thing about 30 verses later in Matthew 19, verse 13. He says, then children were brought to him, that is to Jesus, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and he went away. And so Jesus puts an exclamation point on what he has just said in chapter 18. And so again, the truths encased in this passage about Jesus are important to him, and they should be important to us tonight. And so tonight we're going to journey through these texts, through Matthew 18 and through Matthew 19, and look at what they say about us and about Jesus. And so first we're going to look at the disciples, because I think as we go through this story, we're going to see ourselves in the disciples. And this story kind of serves to highlight the kind of followers that Jesus is looking for. So in Matthew 18 and 19, we see two things. We see that the disciples, somewhere along the way, had forsaken their initial mission or what they were initially called to do. Somewhere along the way in the ministry, they had taken their eyes off of Jesus and they had taken their eyes off of the people around them. And instead, they had begun to fix their eyes on themselves. In Matthew 18, verse 1, it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So they come to Jesus and they ask that question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And so we know from uh, parallel accounts of this story in Mark and in Luke uh, that this wasn't just a question that was brought kind of innocently to Jesus. This wasn't just a disciple coming up to Jesus and asking him who is the greatest in the kingdom. But we learn from the other accounts that actually the disciples were arguing and were fighting with each other and trying to figure out which of them was the greatest in the kingdom. And so the only reason this question comes to Jesus is because the disciples are fighting. And so Jesus turns to them and he answers them and shows them what they're looking for. And so when we think about the disciples, they knew from the beginning that Jesus was coming to establish a kingdom. They knew that he was the Messiah, but they didn't know what kind of kingdom he was coming to bring. And so with that, they were hoping that whatever kind of kingdom would arise, that they would somehow inherit some kind of power or some kind of status in it. And so they were clamoring over each other to gain a foothold over anyone else who would want to lay claim to a position in that kingdom. But then in one fell swoop, 
In chapter 18, verse 2, Jesus brings them back to reality. And he says in verse 2, they ask him, who is the greatest? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now I want to stop there for a moment because that's kind of a, a huge statement to make. Think for a moment about what Jesus is saying here, that he pauses everything and he looks at his his disciples and he says, unless you turn and become like this child, then you will never enter the kingdom. To me, as I was reading through that and thinking about that, it would be like if Pastor Bryson pulled me aside after I did something, like if we were out in the lobby and I did something that he didn't like and he pulled me aside and said, unless you change and unless you turn in this area to become like this, you will never enter heaven heaven. That's the weight of what Jesus is saying here. He's telling them that there needs to be something that shifts. There needs to be a changing in them. And so that truth, if you're thinking about it, that was said to you, that would hurt and that would sting. And it was meant to kind of shake the disciples. And what Jesus is is doing here is he's making clear that what he's about to say is of the utmost importance. So he says, unless you change this, you aren't making it into the kingdom. And the lesson he gives comes in verse 4. He says, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says, if you want to enter the kingdom, you must humble yourself like this child. And in doing so, you will become the greatest in the kingdom. That's it. Jesus doesn't go into a long discourse or a 30-slide PowerPoint into how to enter the kingdom. He simply says, humble yourself like this child. And he's showing the disciples that there's something misplaced in their hearts as they wrestle over who is the greatest, something that needs to change and a difference that needs to take place. And so if you're like me, this might be kind of a difficult teaching for you to absorb Uh, Because I don't know about you, like when I read through scripture and God calls his people to humility, sometimes it's hard for me to understand what that really means. Because humility isn't really something that you can just turn on and off. I can't just wake up tomorrow and be a more humble person. But it, it has to be something that takes place within your heart. But the great thing about Jesus is in this text, but also throughout the entirety of scripture, is that he always gives us an example to follow. And he gives us an image to hold in our mind so that we are not without excuse as to know what he's talking about. And so he gives us this image of humility and he gives us this image of a child. And so tonight I want to look at three things that the disciples would have understood this to mean as they reflected on Jesus's words in chapter 18 and again in chapter 19. So three ways that Jesus is calling the disciples in the way that he's calling us today to humble ourselves. Number one is this, is know who your father is. Know who your father is. In calling them to be like children, Jesus is showing the disciples how to view themselves in light of God. And so to understand what Jesus is saying here, we have to understand uh, what comparing someone to a child would have meant in that culture. And so to the disciples, through their eyes and how they would have understood what Jesus was saying, children in that culture were people of zero significance, Children were viewed almost as property. They were called to submit to authority. They would never be seen as someone in charge. They would never be held in honor. They would never be listened to. A child would never be placed over somebody else. Children in this culture were to be seen and not heard. And a child was expected to fall in line completely with their father, who was the head of the house. And so to the disciples, when Jesus came, again, they thought that he was going to be this conquering king, the one who would overthrow Rome and lay claim to the throne in Israel. And once that throne was established, surely he would look to his best friends to become powers in that kingdom. And so as they're thinking of this and as they're having these images of grandeur and honor in their own hearts and in their own minds, Jesus comes to them and he cuts directly through that with the call to humble yourself like this child. This would have devastated the apostles. They greatly desired to make much of their names, and Jesus essentially in this passage is telling them to be a nobody. But Jesus is making it clear here that the reality of who the disciples are in comparison to who God is. 
And so Jesus had already set himself up for this discourse in Matthew chapter 6, where he teaches the disciples to pray to God and to regard God as Father. So in this statement, Jesus is making it clear that God is your Father and you are the children. So who is to receive all honor and all glory and all praise? And whose will is to be done? It is not yours, but it is God's alone. And so much like the disciples, it can be easy for our agendas or for our desire for control and reign to get in the way of the kind of heart that Jesus is looking for. We may not admit it, but we all have areas in our lives where we try to block off a corner of God's kingdom for ourselves. I know for me in my own heart that I can claim Jesus as Lord, but I can hold on to certain areas that I don't want to submit to his lordship. That there's certain areas I want to give to Jesus, but there's certain areas that I don't want to give to Jesus. And I want to keep off limits, and I want to raise up my own flag and say that I reign over this area. And it's when life no longer becomes about him, but becomes about us, that we lose the childlikeness that he's searching for. And if we're not careful, we can let unimportant, non-eternal things get in the way of the main thing, which has always been and always will be Jesus. And so maybe it's your job when you become so focused on your career that you have no time to spend with Jesus and no time to build his kingdom. Maybe it's your finances where you want to hold on to the money you have instead of giving it because of the security that it brings you. Maybe it's your relationships when a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse or a child becomes so important that they take the place of God in your life. Maybe it's the fear of man when we care so much about what others think of us that we don't share Jesus or stand for truth because we fear that they might look down on us. And we can rationalize it and and make it out that it's okay and we can say, I'm following Jesus in this area so it's okay if I don't follow in this area when in fact Jesus came for all of our hearts and all of our obedience so that his kingdom would spread to every corner of our heart and that his name would be over every single part of our lives. So in my kingdom, it's what I say goes. Where I want to go matters. What I want matters most. And if we're not careful, again, we can set ourselves up as king and not God. And we can find ourselves before Jesus asking, who is the greatest? And how can I be the greatest when the greatest is standing in front of us? It's about him. It's about what he wants. It's about what he says because he is God and we are the children in this kingdom. And what Jesus shows us in times like these, when we don't want to follow God's will but want to go our own way, is that we can cultivate humility by remembering who our Father is. Of himself, our God says in Isaiah chapter 45, 22 through 25, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. And to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. In the Lord all the offspring, all the children of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. Scripture makes it clear that there is only one name in the end that will be lifted high above every other name, and that is the name of Jesus. And so I want us to think for a moment about that day when Jesus comes back, when he descends in glory and his eyes are alight with fire and with passion for his church, and the earth is shaking at the weight of his glory. If we want to cultivate humility, we can think about that moment. Because in that moment, no one is going to be looking at me. No one is going to be looking at you. But every single eye is going to be fixed on Christ. We could be standing in a room with Moses and David and Elijah and the disciples and Paul. But the moment that Jesus Christ comes back, every eye is going to turn to him. Every person will fall down and will say that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because life is not about us. There is only one name that will be exalted in the kingdom, and he does not share glory. So the words of Jesus in this passage are a loving and a humbling call to know that to enter the kingdom is to become like this child, to lose all notion that I am in control, that this is about me, that I am the one who is to receive honor and glory and power and fame, because the child does not claim these things, but he attributes them to the father. 
So again, we see it's not my kingdom, but his. What he says goes, and where I follow, or where he leads, I follow. And the beautiful thing is we see that Jesus himself models this for us as the perfect son of God. In Philippians 2, Paul says that even though he was equal with God, he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. But it says in verse 8 that Jesus, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Even Jesus knew that his life was all about pointing to the Father, and so he humbled himself and became obedient to point to God. And so a question for us to, to contemplate as we think about that tonight is this, is that is Jesus my everything? Is Jesus my everything? Is he everything in my family? Is he everything at my job? Is he everything in my life? Am I making his name famous? Am I waking up thinking about Jesus? Am I going to bed thinking about Jesus? It's all of my life, all for him. I know for me, just personally, like in my own role, even here at this church, is that it's easy for me, and whether it's in speaking or whether it's offstage leading a team or leading a small group, that it can easily become about honor and about glory and about winning those things to myself. And a lot of times I can even reason my, with myself that in order to win people to Jesus, I have to first win them to me that their first step is to come to me before they come to Christ, that I have to show them my wisdom and my love and my strength when my role as a child in the kingdom is not to attribute any of those things to myself. It's only that everyone who would come to me, I would say, don't look at me for wisdom, but look at Jesus. Don't look at me for strength, look at Christ. Find everything you're trying to find in him. This is what our lives are supposed to do. They're supposed to bring all glory and all honor and to attribute everything good to God. And so in order to humble ourselves, we must remember who our God is, that he is the king. And we are the children meant only to point to him. And what we find is that in pointing to him, we can expect pushback from the world, which leads to point number two, which is this, is that we need to know that persecutions will come and we need to embrace them. That we need to know that persecutions will come and we need to embrace them. Jesus here is foreshadowing the kind of persecution that's going to come to his disciples and he's telling them to embrace it because he's not only telling them that in becoming like a child that you're going to, he's not only pointing to um, the relationship between themselves and God, he's speaking to a reality that's about to come to pass, that if the disciples sought to follow him and to make Christ their everything, that in the world they would become lowly and they would be seen as the least of these. They wanted to be the greatest, and Jesus said that they would need to become the least. And so he's telling them, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my children in my kingdom, you need to forsake any notions of greatness. This means that rather than seeking to or clinging to honor and fame, that we need to lay it all down if it means following Jesus. Again, we see the picture that they have in their own mind of ruling and reigning in his kingdom. In Jesus' example of a child, as he's standing there and pointing to the example of humility that they need to follow, and there's a huge disparity between what they want and what Jesus says they need to become. And Jesus says, unless you're willing to take upon yourself this mantle of the least of these, you will not enter the kingdom. And so the implications for us today are the same, that in calling us to become children of God, Jesus is saying that we need to lay aside our desires for honor and status in favor of the position of the servant and the shamed and the ridiculed. Even if that means that the world will think that we're a fool for following him. And so the question for all of us is, are we doing this? Or are we letting the fear of man dictate what we do and say? Are we limiting who we interact with based off of the perception of the people around us? Do we see someone who is hurting and broken, whether it's a family member or a coworker or a homeless person on the side of the street, and do we step in to bless them, even if it would bring sideways glances and the dishonor of associating with someone who the rest of the world sees as lowly? And I know for all of us, and I know for me, that we can so often fall short in this and take the easy way out. But what I want to focus on very quickly is the reward that comes from this kind of childlike obedience. Because like the disciples, we can see that, and we can see what Jesus is calling people to, and we can immediately kind of despair or think that Jesus is calling us to lose and become uh, 
something less than what we see in our eyes. But what we see is that ultimately we fall into this trap of not obeying Jesus because we believe a lie. We believe that going our own way and doing our own thing above the law of Christ is going to bring us life, when in reality, Jesus has set it up so that if we follow him, even if we bring on shame and persecution, we will find the greatest joy in him. And what we see is that Jesus is calling his disciples to sacrifice, but he's in no way telling them that they are going to come out of this for the worst. On the contrary, he's calling them to a greater blessing because he says to be the least in this world is to be the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus is not calling the disciples to lay down their joy. He's showing them the pathway to joy, and he's telling them to take up their cross and follow him in that pathway. The, what he's telling them to do here is much like what he tells um, the, the rich young man in um, Matthew chapter 19 as well. We're actually going to look at his discourse in Mark chapter 10, though, because he kind of dives a little deeper into it. But the story of the rich young ruler is that Jesus comes to this man, and the man asks him, what can I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, if you sell all of your possessions and follow me, then you will enter the kingdom. And rather than doing that and clinging to Christ, instead he walks away and the Bible says that he is disappointed. And so we pick up in Mark chapter 10, verse 28, where Peter, after seeing this, comes to Jesus and it says in verse 28, Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. So he does say that all of this is sure to come with persecutions, but he says that you will receive this and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. We have a good father who does not call us to suffer for no reason, and he does not fail to reward those who follow him. Again, we see Jesus being our example in this, and that he himself chased his own joy in suffering for us and for the father. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says that Jesus, who for the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus endured the cross, and he took on the shame, and he despised it for the joy that was set before him, the joy of pleasing God and being with him eternally. So obedience to the call to leave behind this life for Jesus will only lead us to joy. He tells the disciples, you're not going to be a king, that you will be lowly in this world, but that you will be the greatest in the kingdom. And so for us today, that looks like knowing that persecutions will come, but embracing them anyway. It looks like casting off the lie that following ourselves is greater than the reward that comes from following Christ. So that's point number two. Point number three is this, is that to humble ourselves and to become like a child in the kingdom is to love the least of these. So to love the least of these. Jesus was showing his disciples the mission of God and reminding them to keep it on the forefront. Something that's interesting in both Matthew 18 and 19, both depictions of this in scripture, is we see that the disciples' hearts had turned away from each other and had turned, uh, I'm sorry, away from Jesus and from other people, um, and it had turned towards themselves. And we see in Matthew 18 that they're bickering and they're fighting with each other. And in Matthew 19, they're literally keeping people from coming to Jesus. And in both instances, Jesus reveals that his heart is different from ours. In Matthew 18, Jesus answers the question, who is the greatest, not by beckoning and bringing forth a man of stature and wisdom, but by bringing forth a lowly child. And Jesus shows us that he loves the humble. In Matthew 19, again, Jesus reveals that his love surpasses ours, arising to the level of a father as he becomes defensive because the disciples are pointing people away. And in verse 13, again, it says, then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. The disciples and themselves were on another mission and Jesus here shows them what his mission truly is. And he reminds them to keep it on the forefront. 
And so his mission is this, is that Jesus Christ came for the lowly and the broken, the humble, the outcasts, and the, the, those who the world want nothing to do with. And an important note here is that this sense of lowliness is not just limited to those who are low in stature in society, but to all who are broken and lowly and humble in heart. That is who Jesus is seeking to worship him. Because Jesus tracked down lepers who were despised and uh, forced to the outskirts of society. And he tracked them down because they needed a savior and he came for them. But Jesus also tracked down Zacchaeus who was rich and powerful And yet when Christ came, he was humbled and he saw how he had sinned against God and against his neighbor. Zacchaeus needed a savior and Jesus came for him. In the same way, people in our family, in our life, in our city are in desperate need for a savior. And Jesus wants to find us doing everything we can to push others towards him, not to keep them away from him. So this transformation happens in our hearts when we look away from ourselves and we fix our eyes on Christ and on the least of these, and as we seek to become the least of these in order to reach the least of these. So in closing, I want to answer the question of how do we do this? So if we want to focus on the least of these and we want to gain access to Christ's heart in loving the lowly, how do we do this? And I want to look at four points before we close. So the point number one is this, is that we need prayer. We need prayer. What I know of me and what the text reveals about the disciples is that we are not inherently attracted to the humble or the least of these. In fact, most often it's most desirable and most convenient to avoid the least of these in this world. Yet it's undoubtedly true that Jesus was not attracted to power or status, but Jesus was attracted to weakness. The gospel begins with us broken and cast off and ends with Christ picking us up in his arms and making us brand new. And so there needs to be a change in our hearts that takes place in order for us to have the heart that Jesus has. We need to have surgery to remove haughty eyes that we might gain the eyes of Christ so that we don't look down on the weak, but that we cherish them. We need a new tongue that we would not speak with distaste toward the least of these, but that we would only speak love and grace over them. And all of these things, all of these changes take place in us through prayer by the power of God's spirit alone. And we'll find that the more that we pray for the least of these, the more our heart will turn towards them. Because where our prayers go, our hearts are sure to follow. And so we need to make a plan to pray, even if it's only for five minutes a day, just to take time to pray for those in our life who need Jesus. And to pray for our own heart as well, that we would love them the way that Jesus does. And again, we'll find that as we pray for them, that our hearts inherently will turn towards them. So we need prayer. The second thing we need is we need a plan. We need a plan. I don't know about you, but for me, it's easy to kind of get fired up or ramped up about something that's said on Sunday and then immediately forget it on Tuesday. And we see that the, the gospel and everything that Christ came to do happened according to a plan, that it was Jesus' intention from the beginning to come and to save, and he tracked down the people that he was looking for. And so in the same way, we need a plan to reach out to the least of these. Last week, Pastor Bryson pointed out um, in the story of the widow of Nain that love looks, that love stops and it fixes its eyes on the broken and on the weary, and it looks for those who need Christ, and it steps in. And we'll see when we stop and we look that there is no shortage of the least of these in Phoenix. We have to find where there is a need, and we have to become like Jesus and step into that need. And we all have someone in our life that we can take by the hand and that we can lead to Jesus. And again, like we said last week, we don't need to start big, but we can start small. We can start with one person and come alongside them and lead them to Christ. So let's talk for a minute about kids, because in Matthew 18 and in Matthew 19, Jesus is taking his time to give love and attention to children who no one else in that society wanted to take a second out of their day to be with. And that shows that our, our Savior has a heart for the children of the world. And so at Relentless, one of the things that we say, one of the things that we say that we're for is that we're for the next generation because we know that those we now see as children are going to one day grow up to be the next generation of world changers. And so while they're growing up, we can win them to Christ and train them up in 
truth that they would go out and they would be gospel heralds in this world to win people to Christ. And the greatest thing a child can have in this life is somebody who can come alongside them and not only tell them about Jesus, but show them who Jesus is through their actions. And we talk a lot about discipleship in this church, but it's just as true and just as important that we disciple children as they grow up. And so making a plan to focus on children in your life might look like getting more involved in refugee ministry that we have here at the church going to apartments that are 15 minutes away with families that are coming from unreached people groups that have no access to the gospel and who don't even know what a Christian looks like, don't know what a Christian sounds like. And we can step into that situation and we can be like Christ to that family and we can step in where there's kids and families have five or more children and they're lacking food and lacking clothes and we can step into that situation and show them who Jesus is. It might look like reaching out to children in our community. And that's why right now we have this school drive going so that we can not only love and bless the people in our community, but so that we can connect with them and share the hope of the gospel with them. And so we want to ask you to give to that initiative, but more than that, God might lead you to get involved and to partner with ministry that reaches out to the kids that are growing up in this community, that we can reach them for Christ so that they will continue to win more in our community to Jesus. Beyond just kids, Jesus might be calling you to a coworker that is going through a rough patch to stop what is going on and to turn our hearts and our eyes towards them. And to say, I know you're going through a rough patch right now, and I know that it's been difficult, but I love you, and I want to take time to hear what you're going through and to bless you and to find out how I can help. Maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a homeless person you see outside the store that you're shopping in. And maybe making a plan for you means that you need to plan to be more spontaneous. Maybe it means that you plan to take time, even if you don't want to, when you'd rather go somewhere else to spend time with someone who is hurting. Isn't that exactly what Jesus is doing in Matthew 19? Like in his planner, I don't think that he had praying over children at 3 p.m., but we see that they came to him and Jesus stopped, that the king of the universe stopped everything he was doing to spend time with those who no one else in the world would want to spend time with. And so we can all stop for a moment to be like Jesus if it means blessing someone else. Because again, there's no shortage of opportunity, but it takes us prayerfully finding an area, planning to move and jumping in with all that we have. And that leads me to point number three is that we need commitment. We need commitment. Because love does not come without sacrifice. For the disciples, it was the hope of rule and reign that Jesus told them to get rid of in favor of becoming humble and lowly. In the same way, reaching the least of these is going to be hard. It's going to take up our time, meaning that we're going to have to not do stuff that we want to do. It's going to take our resources, meaning that sometimes we'll have to give until it hurts. And it's going to be a road that is sure to be filled with pain and confusion and setback, all of which will be outweighed by the joy set before us as brothers and sisters come into the kingdom and meet Jesus. So the third thing we need is we need a commitment to commit to win others to Christ. And the last thing we need is we need a family on mission. We need a family on mission. Because much like the disciples, again, we can forget the importance of who Jesus is and what he came to do. And so what we need is other Christ-like individuals who will continue to to light that fire in us and will continue to stoke the flames of obedience with truth from God's word, who will push us to go outside of our comfort zone even when we don't want to go. As beloved children, we need to link arms with our brothers and sisters as we live for the one true king, King Jesus. And so to be involved in a family doesn't mean to simply come on Sunday. It means to linger. It means to build relationships. It means to be in a community group so that truth is refreshed during the week. It means to be a real family where you love the people that sit next to you on Sunday and they love you. Only a family on mission is going to change the world because that's the way that Jesus set it up. For he himself said that we are his body. And so to be like Christ means to come together to reach the world around us. So the last thing again that we need is a family on mission. And as a family, we need to give everything we have for his honor, even if it means that we become fools in the eyes of the world. 
So going forward into this next week, we want to encourage you to do all of these things. As you seek humility, remember to focus on who your father is. Remember to know that persecutions will come, but to embrace them anyway and to love the least of these. And the way that we do that is we do that by praying. We do that by praying for the least of these and for ourselves. We do it by planning, by making a plan and committing to it. And we do that by surrounding ourselves with other Christians who are going to light the fire in us to run after Jesus. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you so much um, just for this ability to gather with you tonight. Jesus, we pray that you would help us to understand uh, the words that you're saying in this text. Um, Father, we pray that you would just help us to see who you are in light of who we are. Help us to understand um, just your glory and how amazing you are. And we pray that we would just um, be filled with worship and with love at all that you are, Jesus. God, we pray that you would break our hearts for what breaks yours and for the people in this world that need Christ. We pray that you would give us um, power and love and strength to be just like Jesus in the lives of those around us. And God, above all, we pray that we would just find immense joy in being your children, that we would just love being with you and love pointing others to you that they would share in our joy. So Father, we just lift all these things up and we just pray um, that you would continue to light that fire in us to follow you. And we pray all this in your name. Amen.